Hello everyone, good afternoon. I'm sure you've all been in like a lot of talks all day, so um, my hope is not to talk at you, but to walk through a lot of these concepts with you and leave you with an understanding of how you can take advantage of brain activity recording devices today. Um, it's Neurotech Week, so a lot of the conversations we've had this week have been around how can we record the brain how can we help you know, treat some of these diseases and things that we do not understand? Um, and a lot of the conversations we had, especially on Monday, we're talking about things that are implanted into your brain or you have to open your head to look at. Yesterday, we talked in some detail about EEGs a little bit, actually. But the goal today is to give sort of a practical experience as to what this could look like for you today and how you can use it. Hence the talk, Understanding the Brain. So a little bit about me and why I'm actually doing this. Very similar with a lot of the things that people are doing, which is to eventually be able to use technology to aid the diagnosis and treatment of neurological and psychiatric disorders. Now, this is a big fit, of course. And assuming that you can do this with just EEG headsets alone is also not what I'm preaching here. What I'm going to talk about today is how we can take advantage of these tools in accordance with other um, tools that exist today, such as behavior recording devices over time, alongside with EEGs, how you can craft experiments and experiences to be able to understand what's going on when you do things. And so that's me, uh, a couple, uh, over a year ago now, and on the right, what you see is how you do brain recordings in the lab today. You have to spend roughly about 10 to 30 minutes putting these caps on your head, applying the saline gel, and then do a 10 to 15 minute recording, which is often some things around motor control. And in some cases, people obviously exper uh, experiment around um, other people's behaviors. Now, thankfully, with the advancement of technology, we now have devices that we can take advantage of today. They look as tiny or as small as a crown that you can just put on your head right away. Um, or they look like headbands that you can wear just around your head here today. And we also have folks working on in-here EEG devices that can take advantage of stuff. Now, the thing about EEGs, though, nonetheless, is there are a lot of comments um, from people about how noisy it is, which is true. Uh, the context in which you record EEG is super important, and you cannot just go ahead making summaries and assumptions from just putting a device on your head. It's important to understand the context, again, that the recording happened, what the person was doing at the time. And our approach essentially is to build a platform that allows you investigate in any of these areas without having to be an expert. Um, we're open source and we allow anyone to build on top of the work that we do. And we are collaborating with other device manufacturers, EEG researchers, to be able to take advances in research that happens just in the lab today and bring it to things that you can experience on your mobile phone, on your computer, and at home. Now, if there's any takeaway from this call, from this uh, session, I want you to leave with a basic understanding of brain activity frequencies, some simple ways in which we can analyze brain data, and what does it mean when we say that EEG data is noisy and how can we deal with that? Uh, what you see on the right, for example, is a very interesting chart that just shows brain activity power over time. And I mean, from just looking at it, your first question is like, what does this mean? Like, it looks cool, but like, what does this mean? And these were the questions that I asked consistently over and over again to other researchers um, when I started experimenting with EEG devices about four years ago. And the answer kind of looks like this. I'll tell them that, oh, I can see like, you know, alpha power is increasing or some beta power is increasing. Like, oh, this has to mean something because stuff is moving. And then they're like, oh, well, it depends. And, and then I ask, like, what does it depend on? And then they say things like, well, it depends on the time of the day that the recording happened. Uh, what were you doing? 
Um, did you eat anything before you did this recording? Um, like, you know, is this the same state or the same experiment that you're doing over time? And I essentially spent roughly about one to two years um, recording data that ended up with it depends as the summary. Um, and of course, I did not want to continue to do that, but I wanted to continue to investigate. And that led us to building the Neurofusion platform and asking that what are the fundamental type of experiences that can help us start to make sense of variances in our brain activity over time and use that in conjunction with advances in psychology research, such as experience sampling and make sense of EEG data. Now, the first thing I'm going to tell you fundamentally, and some people might fight me for this, but if you ever buy an EEG device, if there's anything that you can go away with, you should probably just try to record your brain at rest, which means what is your baseline? Uh, what does it mean when your eyes are closed, even if it's just for 30 seconds or one minute? And if you do that consistently, like for one day, two days, or consistently over the span of a week, you start to somewhat see that there is, there's a relationship between that and the literature that exists today. And you no longer have to start asking, what does this mean? What context is this going on in? And how do you make sense of that? We, one of the first things that we did in January of 2023 was do like a week long type recording of EEG data and then try and make sense of these brain activity frequencies and what do they look like. Again, you can think of these things as just numbers that represent different um, decompositions of a whole time period of EEG recordings. Time periods of EEG recordings is stuff I'll show you um, because it's supposed to be an interactive session, not just me talking at you. And hopefully, you know, it generates a lot of interesting questions that people might have around this area. And we will talk about how do you actually create custom experiments that answer questions that are relevant to just you. Um, so yeah, so this is brain at rest. And the rest in state EEG data is one of the most fundamental data sets, like I said earlier. It's been shown to be able to look at people across areas of well-being. It's been shown to help explain Different, con different conditions in relation to cognitive decline. And again, like I said, if you get a hold of anyone with an EEG or you buy an EEG, you probably want to do a rest and state recording first. But there's obviously a lot more than just doing your rest and state data, right? What we want is for people to be able to investigate, ask questions, deploy custom type of things that can answer those questions for them, and then make that work. So as an interesting uh, challenge to ourselves as a platform, last week we decided to recruit a couple of people that are interested in playing chess and telling them, hey, you know, put these headsets on your head and play some chess. And we'll try to understand or walk through a process of explaining what is going on in the brain while people are playing chess. Thankfully, this is not new. Researchers have spent time looking at theta power and its relationship with cognitive workload for different people. And so we decided to investigate. And to be honest, I didn't know if we were going to find anything. Um, I actually thought, like, you know, I might spend the whole time doing that and not see anything at all. But thankfully, uh, in some of the analysis we were doing just recently, we found some interesting results. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to show you, um, first of all, what the experience of doing a recording is like and how do you go about analyzing this data. Now, it might seem like something beyond reach, but it's not. Uh, if you have ever tried to run a Python script, um, stuff that GPT-4.0 can do these days, so it means if you can actually run commands, you can start to do some initial experiments in relation to neurotechnology and neuroscience. And I want you to go away with believing that you can actually do that. And I'll walk you through an example of a scenario where people are playing chess and then trying to make sense of what that looks like. All right. so. I'll get right into it. Um, first of all, right now, I just have this EG headset on my head. And it's probably, yeah, I'm just adjusting it because it's probably a bit noisy. What you see, and I'm going to change to light mode so it's a bit easier to, to make sense. Um, you might not be able to, OK, I think you can probably start to see it a little bit. Um, what this is is a simple web platform where we have it's a simple web platform where we have designed some cognitive experiments similar to stuff and literature um, in the papers that exist today and have ways for people to essentially do recordings based off of that. 
Now, at the same time, we also allow for people to do custom type of things, but I'll talk through some of the experiments that we've set up. The first one is an open-ended brain recording. That means that I can just do my brain recording while I'm having conversations with people, while I am watching a game. But again, don't forget, you have to do your rest and stay first. Um, I know, I know it might seem boring, but like just having something as a baseline to compare against is very, very relevant and important. What the rest of the state looks like for anyone who hasn't experienced that before is essentially you, just give it one sec, it's supposed to load up within here. What the rest of the state is, is essentially you having your eyes alternate um, closed and open at different intervals. And that's pretty much it. For about 15 to 30 seconds, you will do that at, at, frequent, at frequent intervals. And it just looks like this. You look at a course, and I'm going to start an EEG recording. And what you see here is essentially just like a time series of raw voltage activity for my brain in this current moment now. And if you were doing this recording, you would stare at it, you would open and close your eyes. Um, but obviously, like, I'm not going to do that right now because I'm going through different things. Um, a different one, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is the whole Flappy Bird game. Um, where it was, I mean, the people who made the game eventually decided to stop making this game because of the amount of psychological damage that it had on people. But for the purpose of experimentation for us, it was an interesting way to be able to observe emotional violence and frustration from people. And this core thing of the fact that EEG is basically just voltage recordings from your skull, and that comes together with timestamps. When you do cognitive experiments or play games like this, we can also attach timestamps to things like just a spacebar press, download that data, and try to do correlations with that. We did that specifically for the game of chess, like I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to switch over to explaining what that looked like. Uh, we basically had a group of people play a game on Lee Chess, as you can see, hopefully, just about here. And I'm going to walk you through how we went about analyzing that and basically how you can do this yourself in the future if you need to. So do not be discouraged by whatever this looks like, but I'll walk you through just from the beginning and answer questions about, oh, OK, how do you analyze this type of data? Uh, it's supposed to be somewhat of a deep dive, but I will try to explain this concept in the simplest forms, um, and I'll change this token afterwards, so don't try to copy it. Anyways, so when we when we had people play the game of chess, what happened after that was we made an API call to Lee Chess to get the timestamp intervals of when the moves happened. Again, for any form of correlation, which is one of the things that EEGs are very good at in cognitive testing, you need to have access to the timestamps, um, or at least the time periods to be able to explain what is going on. And so we did that for this, and we wrote a simple script that allows us to then feed in this data and then look at it. Now, I mentioned some things earlier when I was talking, and I'll spend some time just explaining these two charts here. The first chart that you see above is basically a Fourier transform representation of the data. When you record EEG, it somewhat looks like this. When you record EEG, it kind of looks like this. It's basically just a time series of things, and I'm not sure it's very clear, but let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. And it can look a bit noisy. But to actually get any sort of relevant things from the data, you can also do some artifact rejection that essentially cleans this data set to make it easier to analyze and removes artifacts such as hand movements, eye blinks, and co. And then you have this thing called a spectrogram, I mean, a topograph. What the topograph is is basically saying how much of brain activity power, and in this case, you can just think of it as literally as it is brain activity power in different regions but relative to each other. And here we look at these different frequency bands, alpha, delta, beta, all these things that I mentioned depends, right? It depends on literature and depends on the context of what you're doing. Literature around the game of chess and cognitive workloads hints to the fact that theta power or an increase in theta power is likely related to people actually having like, you know, more work to do in essence or in air quotes. And that was what we were actually essentially trying to test out. And so there are open source tools that allow you to actually read in your data sets, um, split them, 
and then make sense of what that looks like. So I showed the spectrum chart, and this is what you can see all over here again. It's just showing the lighter colors mean there's more power in a particular region. This is an eight channel EEG headset. Um, they have four channel headsets and they're even like single two channel headsets. Now, again, in the lab, you have to wear the 64 channel big things in your head and they have their own purpose. My belief is that a lot of the work that happens in labs are related to like motor control and they want to investigate things around like decision making. But when you're looking at a long time period or periods where people are relatively still, um, these eight channel devices, four channel devices, two channel devices, we believe can do some good amount of explanation of what is actually going on. And that's essentially what we're trying to prove out here. And so for this particular um, test that we did, we eventually were able to get out the indices of when the moves happened and when a person was actually doing things. And then going from there to go ahead and find the exact timestamps that were, that, were, that were related to it. Again, like I said, the timestamp is pretty much the most important thing that you need to get a hold of when you're doing EEG analysis. And after getting the timestamps, we're able to split the moves for the white player and the black player. And then we can see, based on how the game goes, what moves the person made. And the next step here is saying, how can we match that with the raw time series of EEG that we have recorded? Now, if you're familiar with any form of data science, this is nothing spectacular. Uh, I'm not trying to diminish the work that we're doing, but I'm just being very honest. Um, ChatGPT can generate some of these things. You just have to teach it what you want it to do. But in this case, we're basically assigning the moves to the raw time series of EEG and of EEG data that we had. And from there, going ahead to create these things that one would call epochs. Now, epochs are essentially saying, I have this whole time series of data and I have these chunks of where things happened. So I have this chunk of when you know, the coin moved to a particular position or when this player moved from a particular position to another, and then mapping them to each other and creating these things we call events. Now, I mentioned or I showed an example earlier of noisy EEG data. So for example, this is from one of the channels of EEG recordings, and it might not be very clear from behind, but like trying to do any analysis from this amount of variance is it's pretty much like you're, it's, I don't want to use the word fool's gold, but you're, you're, the thing about EEG is you would get whatever you want. Like it's, it's basically numbers. So you can fool yourself, but you have to try your best not to fool yourself. And that's where artifact reduction comes in. And we use you know, open source tools that allow us to essentially reduce the amount of variance, but still maintain the relevant details that are in there. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think the first thing is when you have a time series of EEG data, um, this variance that we're talking about is just high amount of changes in the voltage. And so artifacts can range from like, you know, head movements, hand movements, these people were playing chess on their computer, so at least they didn't have the whole hand movements there, but there was still significantly a lot of noise that we had to try and filter out. And that's essentially what we we're trying to remove when we did artifact removals. And again, like quite interestingly, the line for removing artifacts, and the, my, my main takeaway from this um, session here is to demystify the like, oh, this is some really like science, sci-fi things. It's, People have already made, uh, what's the word? People have made open source tools that are based on papers to actually do the analysis for you and to clean or auto reject sig uh, signals. It's literally three lines of code. Um, so, I mean, I think everyone here can run three lines of code if they have the right computer environment to do that. But going away from there and more towards the kind of interesting things is after we split the, the data sets into the epochs that we cared about, we started observing like this topographs that I mentioned. So that is for all of the different moves that were happening, how much brain power was exerted at different points in time. Now, it might not be very clear when you look at it, but what I was using when I was eyeballing this data set afterwards was the relative power um, that occurred across the different frequency bands. The relative power essentially is saying like from a particular chunk of recording, how much alpha do you have compared to like your delta power or compared to like your data power. And so it's going away from just the raw values of like, oh, this is like 3.4, you know, millivolts um, per frequency hertz. But actually looking at saying, okay, well, 
in relation to all of the other frequencies that happened, this is what is most predominant. And so I was looking for something where like for over almost like you know 0 0.4, 0 0.5 percent uh, of the recording, we had like you know high amount of theta power. Again, from the paper that we were basing this work on, theta power is a good like marker for cognitive decline. I mean, cognitive workload, <laughs> not decline. I mean, I guess you can measure that over time and then do longitudinal analysis to see whether the decline happens or not. Um, but when I looked at this, what was quite interesting for me was saying, what happened in the chess game? Again, having markers towards the activities that happened is one of the things that are most important. And these are the goodness of what we can get with EEG data. And so I'm gonna see if I can get my screen back here. And, and this is a section of the game that co coincides with these sets of uh, topographs that I'm about to show you. Now, over here in this particular move, this was right here. here. And so player white is the person that we're looking at. And just before this move, um, the bishop was attacking the pawn that was here. Seems like a good move. Um, and then White had to decide what to do. Now, in this particular period where White was going to make the move of capturing the bishop, you can actually see the coinciding EEG um, theta power with the max of roughly about 0.56% of the total ones, and the alpha power, not as much. And it's kind of like this ratios that you use to actually deduce what is actually going on. Um, again, like I guess this is where this is where the work that we're doing kind of leads towards. We don't want you to have to memorize all the literature to be able to come up with deductions. But don't take my word for it, right? We're going to look at a couple more moves that happen next. Um, the next move after that was something like this, where the queen was under attack by this bishop, and the queen moved to um, a4. a4 trying to attack the king right here, and then the other queen blocked this move. And now this person had it to decide what to do. They, oops, I moved way too fast, sorry. This person had to decide what to do. They had to decide whether or not to capture this piece um, or do something else. And this was also one of the moves that lasted this person roughly about 20 seconds to make. Coinciding with this particular move period here, we can also see a high amount of theta power again for when the person went ahead to capture this piece. Um, now, some might say, and again, like, we were looking, I think what was nice about this was looking at the analysis from like the chess engine here. The chess engine actually did say that the person made the wrong move and it was not the right move to make. It was a challenging position, of course, but they could have made other alternative options. And this right here is just showing how we can use some of the core building blocks of EEG analysis to start to explain what is going on. And the next steps from this is actually saying that, okay, while we have this simple individual things that we can explain, can we actually get this in a quantitative form such that anyone can do this stuff at home and get the right amount of information to be able to make decisions? And when you go from there, the next thing is, can we actually try to stimulate, not just from like, you know, putting stuff on the brain, but like audiovisual cues or interventions that people do to essentially help make people adjust to high stress scenarios or any other conditions that happen? Which is why we built the platform Neurofusion to allow for people to upload custom types of experiments for whatever it is that they're trying to do. And they can ask these questions and then create customized experiments to actually tend to answer these types of questions that people have. Uh, going back to the presentation real quick, some of the things that we want to investigate moving forward is, I mean, it sounds like a buzzword now, but is towards a foundational brain model. Mark is gonna talk a little bit more about this and the building blocks uh, later on Friday. But basically, the context is that if we are able to, to, to look at EEG data and this change in frequencies, but we're not able to explain these things unless we have some somewhat expertise, right? And we go through the rigor of validating against research papers. Can we start to build models that understand brain activity data well enough to be able to predict um, what most people will call the next token. But in the simplest form, it's basically saying, based on experience or seen events, can we predict the next one in the context of an experiment? Please keep in mind that, again, all of this is in the context of experiments that happen or things that are followed with some sort of rigor. But then 
when we say followed with some sort of rigor, then the question is like, you know, while I'd love for everyone to be a scientist, not everyone is a scientist. So the question is, how do you take advances in research and science and bring it to the homes of people? Our bet with Neurofusion is that you can essentially create these types of experiments, deploy them for anyone to run, have a live URL that people who have the headsets can essentially record, and consent to sharing that data with you. And when they consent to sharing that data with you, we can start to build these somewhat large open data sets, right, with these you know, relatively inexpensive devices. They used to cost tens of thousands of dollars, but now we have these for less than a thousand dollars. And I believe that these can be funded to actually build data sets that can help um, answer these questions that we have. Which kind of leads to the next thing. A shameless plug is that we are recruiting people that are interested in participating in you know, research studies or things that we are looking to investigate. So please scan the QR code if you're interested and you can join one of our next studies uh, in the future. Um, at the moment, I cannot commit to giving you the devices for free, <laughs> but um, we'll, our hope is to provide devices and curate this kind of custom experiments, not just with playing chess, but the reason why we picked chess was because it was, an, it was, first of all, an impromptu type of task and activity, and it was a challenge to see if we can actually see anything from brain activity data. This was recorded just last week. It, we didn't have to spend months and months of analysis to kind of see some interesting things in the data sets. And, and that's like the first thing like you, you need to do, right? Like, do you notice any interesting trends um, before trying to push a lot of large efforts towards EEG data recordings? And that is the end of my talk. The idea was to make this a somewhat interactive session. So I expect, to, I expect people to have questions really around the things that they're interested in when it comes to understanding the brain, and for us to have an open discussion about what types of experiments can we create to start to answer these things. Um, I know people that have expertise in this area in this room also, and they can help provide some guidance alongside myself. So the floor is open now if you have any questions, and I'll be happy to answer you. Thank you.